Welcome to the lab. Today I'm working on a little side project here. I kind of got sick and tired of working on FPGAs for a while. So I came up with this device here. What it is, it's a clock that has red, green, blue, seven segment displays and red, green, blue LEDs on it and it's driven by three microcontrollers. So I saw that Adafruit had these displays for sale and I've been waiting for someone to sell these displays for a very long time so I jumped on it and bought 11 of them and decided to build this clock. So I designed the circuit board in uh, about two days and then I sent away for it and I just got the boards today so I put them together and so I'm just going to go over it. Basically what it is, there are 10 7 segment displays here. There are 10 LEDs in each 7 segment is actually 21 LEDs. It's a red, green, blue for each segment. So that's uh, 240 LEDs total. So there's seven plus one would be eight. And then each display has its corresponding LED. And then that middle one is off of this guy. And so there are 10 driver chips that have 24 outputs designed to run red, green, blue LEDs like this. And right now I just have a simple pattern going here where it's doing a fade from black all the way full brightness on each color and then the combinations. And I was just playing around with it trying to get the white to look white. Now it's getting there but I gotta do some more testing but I'm just trying to get all the hardware working right now. So basically what I got I have three microcontrollers I'll show the back here in a minute. Actually, let me show the back now. Basically, what's on here, there are a micro, there's a microcontroller here, there's a microcontroller here, and another one here. And these three microcontrollers, this one's the system controller, this will actually run the clock itself. This one here is multiplexing and PWMing all the LEDs, and this is a speech synthesizer slash light detector. And what this will do, this will talk, it'll announce the time, and it's using the SP0256 emulator I wrote a while back on the pick to do it. I also can use a Digitalker emulator. I wrote one of those too, but I kind of like the 256, so I may experiment with that a little. And it also reads a light sensor, which is a little one of those little LDRs, and so at night this thing can dim and it won't be so blinding. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten drivers, and these are ST brand, and it's an LED 2472G. And this is the QFN version. It also comes in a QFP, but the QFN's smaller and easier for you to solder, or easier for me to solder. There's a 2748CO4s. These are simply uh, buffering the signals from the pick, so it can drive all these drivers because there's 10 drivers and there's an RGB output enable on each one, so that's 30 inputs I have to drive. So I'm using these to drive those, you know, I think in groups of six, and then the clock and the latch signals to these are, are done in groups of three, three, and four. And someone was asking me, well, how do you determine that? And, well, I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe. I just sort of have a feel for it. You're not supposed to drive more than ten inputs with an output anyway, but I just figured it'd be safe to do it this way, and it doesn't really cost very much since I'm only making, like, one of these. There is an audio amplifier here. There's a little baby six pin SOT23 DAC that I'm going to use to generate the audio. And then there's a little RC filter and it goes into this um, audio amplifier chip. And then there's a connector here for a speaker I haven't soldered on yet. So this will generate the speech. It'll go through the DAC and it'll be amplified and output to the speaker. So if I want an alarm or like I said, time announcement. So right now it can, it'll be able to announce the time. And then over here, there's a space for a GPS receiver, and I, I actually have that. It's right here. It's very cute. So it's just a little little babby circuit board with a little metal, tiny metal can, and then a very large antenna on the top. The antenna is like half the size and most of the weight of this. And then this will also work with an external antenna too. So I have the connector and I bought an antenna. I don't have the antenna yet, but I got the connector. So this will just sit over here on the board. Antenna connector is right here. And then I got a five amp buck regulator on here, but I, I need the two resistors and the inductor and I don't have them. And this will be the power connector. 
um, programming, 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 and I got a little little dongle here I made. So the this is a these are PIC uh, 18F2585s on here. So here's the you know ICD3 like usual, and then the cable comes out, and then these uh, these RJ whatever the hell's RJ45s or whatever you call the six pin version. These are a pain in the ass to put on your board or whatever. So I made these cute little adapters here. And it just goes from the ICD3 cable to a little five pin and then I got a little wire that connects to my board. And all the projects I make with these picks have this exact same connector so this is kind of like my standard. And that's pretty much about it on the back side. On the front side here, and that thing is very, very bright. And these, these these LEDs are only running at about five to six milliamps, and they're rated for thirty on the green and the blue, and forty on the red. And I mean that's just obnoxious. The camera is not having it. I can attenuate the light a little bit with a plastic static bag here. And it seems to be working okay, but here I'll try some paper. So here's a piece of paper. Let's see what that does. Man, it's still really bright. Actually, that looks kind of cool, but unfortunately, those LEDs stick up a little bit. And there's a battery holder here, and this is for um, backing up the real-time clock that's in the GPS receiver. So uh, I put the battery holder here, and it runs all the way over to the all the way over to the other side of the board. And then I got a connector here, which will connect to some buttons and switches or whatever to set it. I haven't really figured that part of the project out yet so that's the actual thing lighting up I'll set that over here and here's the board not a lot to it it's just 10 of those LED displays 10 regular RGB LEDs battery holder and my logo and the connector and on the back it's pretty simple These are the LEDs that are on there. They just have, they're uh, just a general five millimeter LED with four leads on them because three is not enough. And then the displays are, there's the display. Unfortunately, they're out of stock in these. They had 50 of these displays. I bought 11 of them and then the next day after I bought my 11, they were out of stock. So I don't know what happened there. So anyways, here's the display itself. It's got uh, 21 pins on it. It has holes for 25, but three of those holes aren't used because that's the decimal point that isn't stuffed. And what's really cool about these, you can easily unclip the circuit board in here and actually see how it works. So I've unclipped it. And that's it, there's seven RGB LEDs surface mounted on the board and in the corner there's room for the green or the decimal point there. So and then in the back of the filter housing it's got the holes for the LEDs and the light just shines through. And then when you're done you just figure out where that decimal point is. It's right there and just put it back in like that and you're good to go. So the other thing I did before I actually had my circuit board yesterday, or before I had the circuit board today, I built this uh, a couple days ago, and what this is, this has two picks on it, the through-hole versions, obviously, the two programming connectors, and then headers, and the headers are connected to this cable, which goes to the logic analyzer on my scope right here. So I was using the logic analyzer on the scope here to debug that LED refresh, and it actually is kind of interesting how it works. It's not a very conventional PWM refresh. Regular PWM, as you know, the LED gets brighter and dimmer depending on the duty cycle of the square wave. Well, on, on my display here, I wanted um, a 12-bit PWM, which is a really deep PWM. That's 4,096 different brightness levels, and the reason I wanted that many is because the human eye is not linear, so I had to calculate the gamma so I input an 8-bit 
red, green, or blue for 24-bit RGB, and then it converts it into the 12 bits for each color that are required to get the proper brightness. So to get a pick like this, to PWM that many bits was kind of a challenge, especially because this thing is driving, this one microcontroller is driving 240 LEDs. And I will ex uh, demonstrate on the logic analyzer how this uh, LED PWMing is achieved. So here's the refreshing going on. So basically the way this works, up here is the clock, this is the, the frame, and these are the um, enable lines, and then output enable, and then CAN bus here, and then this is the actual data going to the display. So we'll zoom in on it here. I gotta change this, so get rid of that. There we go. So now I can zoom in on one frame. So this bit one here shows um, the frame. So every time the frame changes, this toggles. So here is one frame, and there are 143 of these frames a second going to those LEDs. So this right here is the data, and it's counting up from zero. And so basically what ends up happening here, this is a binary refresh. So the display is refreshed 12 times per frame, and each time it's refreshed, the, the on time is half of what it was before. So at first, the display is on 3,276 cycles, and then it's on 16K cycles, then 8, then 4, then 2, then 1, and then 512 cycles, 256, 128, 64, 32, and finally just 16 at the end. And so the way this works is it takes about 800 cycles to refresh the displays, all the shift registers on there. So when I get below um, 1,024 cycles, it gets tricky. I have to actually I have to actually disable the drivers during that. And here's the very last uh, couple bits right here. So as you can see, these pulses get wider and wider as it goes. So this is the 16 cycle pulse. This is the 32 cycle, 64, 128, 256 cycles. And then at 512 and above, it's actually a little different. So basically what it's doing for these refreshes is it's taking 1,024 cycles to do the actual refresh. And you can actually see the refresh here. So this is actually idle time right here. I could actually do something else. So the refresh is actually here. And then the displays are turned on for just a little itty bitty bit right there for the 16 cycle one, then 32, 64, and then 128. And you can actually see that if I zoom in even farther. So the bit zero is right here. And so it's only on that little tiny bit. And I can actually go deeper in the rabbit hole here until the actual CPU clock is visible. So right here is the actual CPU clock and if you count the number of those pulses from this point to this point it should be 16. And I can actually, if I use the cursors here, so I can do that. Let's see if it makes... Oh, this is the 32 cycle one. It's exactly 3.2 microseconds. So if I shift over here, that's actually all the, this is the shift register clock right here is what that is. So here's, let's here, I'll do this. Oh, there's the pulse right there. So this pulse should be 16 clocks wide. So it should be 1.6 microseconds exactly, and it is, because each CPU cycle is 100 nanoseconds. So 100 nanoseconds times 16 should be 1.6 microseconds, and that's exactly what it is. So that's basically how my refreshing is working on this.
And then these are the actual bits being loaded in. And the way that works, it looks kind of strange how I'll, I'll expand it here and try to explain that. So what's happening here is I am clearing all of these bits and then one at a time I'm testing to see if the bit should be set or not for this particular clock. And that is why it looks like the duty cycle is pulses changing because this is the very first one I tested, then this one, then this one, and this one, and so on. That's the very last one I tested. And then right there is when that clock hits. And if I move this uh, cursor, you can actually see that. So that clock hits right at the very end there before they're all cleared again. And that's how I'm loading all 10 of those. So that's why it looks kind of funny like that. And so there should be 24 loads because each driver chip is driving 24 outputs. So, so basically it's R, G, B. Actually in this case it's all R's, all G's, and then all B's. And on the chip itself, it actually they come out of the chip R, G, B, R, G, B, R, G, B. So that's basically it. You can basically see, the, see it counting up here. And then over here, this is kind of a, this data is always here. And what this data is, this is actually the control data that tells the driver chips how much current they should output. And that's done by changing the width of the latch enable. So, what is it, like, yeah, a three pulse latch enable latches um, one of the registers. And then like an eight pulse latch latches these other registers and then the regular refresh it's only just one clock but it's all stretched out because the ac the clock that actually updates the display is this one right here this is actually the 24th clock these are this is the 23rd clock and that's the very last one and then this is the next clock and the reason I did this was so the display would update at a known time and then it would proceed to load the new data, which actually isn't displayed until the next time, which is over here somewhere. Yeah, this is, yeah, right there. And it works the same way. That's the very last clock right there, and then there's the new ones. So this is all done in software on the pick. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty easy to write once I figured it out. And I actually debugged it using this, uh, using the logic analyzer on here, because this is much better than trying to debug it on the LEDs, because you, know, you won't know, may not know what's going on. And basically, the way this works, there's this thing right here. This is the, and that's what I was triggering on before. So we'll trigger on that again. Whoops. Yeah, right there. That's the CAN bus right here. And the way this works is this CAN bus is sending the data from that control pick, which is the, which is on here. This is the control pick, and this is the LED pick. And this control pick is sending that CAN frame every now and again. It's sending it every six frames. So since we're refreshing at 150 hertz, that means the display is getting 25 new frames of data a second. And that, will, that gives a fairly nice and smooth animation for the animations I'm going to do. And there are two pages, so it, it, it swaps back and forth between the pages, so that way you don't see any tearing on the display, and it looks very clean. And that's basically the packet sending the data, and then the new data comes out for six frames, and then it sends the next packet, and so on and so forth. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And, you know, that's basically it. Hope you found this informative. Once I get some more work done on this project, I'll post another update showing it actually keeping time and doing some of the animations I was talking about. But this was just a quick video to show it off what I had right now. Thanks for watching.